so I'm Lauren, and um, as a kid, I lived in this constant state of anxiety. Well, I still do, but started when I was a kid, where I didn't know how I was supposed to behave and what was appropriate to say or not, and it felt like I was always about to get yelled at for saying the wrong thing to Mr. Somebody or so-and-so, so and the rules seemed like they were always changing, and I just wished that I had an older sibling that could show me what to do. Um, I didn't have one, though, so I do, would just hang around any older kids I could find, um, neighbors, cousins, strangers, um, and I remember my mom pulling me aside one time and warning me to stop following them around. She said, they have their own friends. They don't want to spend all their time hanging out with a little kid. Um, but I just love that they all seem to know what to do. That, and following them kind of offered me this relief from this constant confusion of growing up. Um, I think it's so easy to feel exhausted by phrases like social media, follower count, friend request. And those of us that have worked with agencies can't help but feel, feel cynical when the number of Social media impressions is a single measure of success of a project, rather than the sublime experiences we've bent art and science to create. And we realize that we're not just doing the following, our apps and devices are following us. While this might have once given us a comforting sense of acceptance and belonging, it's now overshadowed by an Orwellian fear. But even if you manage to successfully delete your Facebook account, if you say Twitter's dead and you're over Slack, I'm still not embarrassed to tell you that I'm a follower. I just want to follow you. And I sometimes want to be followed too. So this is a series of attempts to follow and some things that I learned along the way. Um, so a few years ago, I was in a very meaningful and intense relationship, but also particularly turbulent. Um, and it, it ended. And it was a sort of relationship where all your friends and family tell you, like, you seem so unhappy, this shouldn't be so hard. To which you answer, you don't know how it really is. You don't know, you don't see. Um, only to realize later that maybe they did see how it was and you were the one that didn't. So in my hurting, I wished for this device that would protect me from this ever happening again. It was in that early moment of quantified self-trackers and promises of life-changing step counting. So in collaboration with Kyle McDonald, we made People Keeper. We only have so much emotional bandwidth Bring it in. and limited time. What's the best of all? Our social circles are widening. We don't know that's bad, but all those relationships <laughs> in general that makes you excited just can be overwhelming. Now there's an app. People Keeper tracks your physical and emotional response while you're hanging out. And it analyzes the data to identify who stresses you out and makes you excited, sad, or happy. See how your relationships stack up. And let People Keeper find the ones that work for you. It'll automatically manage your relationships, so you don't have to. Scheduling time with people that make you feel good. And blocking the ones that don't. Forget fake friends, failed romance, and FOMO. Optimize your social life with People Keeper. Um, yeah, so the idea was an actual app. It would pair with any kind of off-the-shelf heart rate monitor, um, and it would detect when you were starting to feel an emotion, um, and then it would uh, keep track of those things, those feelings, uh, and then give you kind of uh, analytics about who is making you feel which emotion and how much. Um, and, and then take action on your behalf, deleting contacts, scheduling hangouts, et cetera. Um, and the question here is like, it feels weird, it feels wrong, right? But what if, what if a computer can actually make better decisions than you can? What do you do? And who owns this data that exists between two people? What happens if it's used and shared? Uh, it doesn't matter how, whether that's for something good or for something terrifying. Um, and so, uh, we put a lot of research into what it's actually measuring is kind of like how uh, uh, sweaty, or sorry, your heart rate variability. So um, it would, the thing is when you are feeling very calm, your heartbeat is pretty irregular. And then when you start to get more emotional, it becomes very uh, regular. And this is a kind of a fight or flight response sort of thing. So we would detect these periods um, and then kind of log that as like you're feeling some strong emotion, try to identify which one and who you're with. Um, and so we found ourselves writing some code, some pseudocode, something like what, what should happen exactly if uh, anger is detected? What's the correct, uh, correct behavior? Um, and so this here is kind of an absurdity, right, that we see, but yet I, I'm really inspired by devices that actually work in this realm um, in an in a, uh, earnest way. 
I've been inspired for a long time by um, some of the work uh, that coming out of the Effective Computing Group at the MIT Media Lab. Um, this is a Q sensor by the startup Affectiva, um, which basically was used for children with autism spectrum disorders, and they would put these wristbands on children and detect when they were starting to feel anxious. Um, and then as that kind of escalated, uh, they would alert a parent or a teacher so that someone could come in and kind of change the situation to try and ward off that, that outburst. And so I think most of us would say, well, that sounds useful, that sounds healthy and helpful. Um, but then the question for me is like, how do we decide what this normal is that we're trying to like shape people towards? Who, who is to say that um, it's the problem with the child that's feeling stressed out and, and not um, something larger about our society? Um, but in some ways, I always wish I could just get one of these for myself. Something that could alert other people when I was feeling really socially stressed and like warn them to get away from me. Um, and uh, I saw this project a few years ago, Jen Lowe streamed her heartbeat to the internet. And it suddenly made me aware of just how personal this data was, that it's just your heartbeat, but from that I could tell, like she, maybe she's working out, maybe she's sleeping. Um, I noticed it was very high, and then later I found out that she was actually pregnant at that time, so it was very um, uh, revealing, even when it's something so simple as a heartbeat. And then at the same time, we've got researchers that are determining that um, Twitter contains so much information about your relationship status, you could actually build an early breakup predictor. So it could tell you, like, go out and buy some ice cream because, like, it's going to get bad. Um, uh, or Joanne McNeil drew attention to this idea of the emotional labor required in all our interactions and relationships, um, especially expected of women. And so in her browser extension, you can write your message as tersely as you like, and then with a click of the button, add in all the positive emotional extras for you. <laughs> So there's this point of confusion that a lot of people have with PeopleKeeper, and they ask, is this a critical app or is it actually an optimistic vision of, of future that I hope to see? And the answer is both, um, or maybe neither. But what we were trying to do is like position this directly in that space uh, between the two. It's this ambiguous gray area between utopic and dystopic, pleasurable and uncomfortable. And I think this is the space that we have to explore. It's too easy to kind of write things off one way or the other, but to really pick these things apart, we have to sit with them for a minute. Um, and so this was one reason that we went beyond just making a hypothetical video, and it's an actual app that you can download and try. So you have to decide for yourself, do you want to download it? Do you want to use it? Why or why not? And what happens if you do? Um, so we tested this with a group of students at Carnegie Mellon University where we were doing a residency at the Studio for Creative Inquiry. Um, and they were really good sports. They were freshmen and sophomores, so they were kind of just getting to college and figuring out how, how, friendship, how their friends fit, how they fit, uh, how those relationships worked. Um, and so they really kind of just, uh, without thinking about it too much, just tried it. Um, wore them around campus for a week. We gave them a special version that actually took action on their Facebook, because that's where a lot of them were most socially active, so it could uh, invite people to events or post on other people's walls on their behalf. Um, and I just wanted to share some of their, their reflections. My name's Miles Payton, and I'm a student and teenager. I'm hoping it'll be informative more than anything. It's gonna kind of remind me, like, hey, you should pay attention to how you're feeling around this person. Using the app as a justification for not wanting to spend time uh, with someone um, is a lot more definitive than like just saying, like, I'm uncomfortable. <laughs> Very informative in sort of what I was doing and how um, my interactions with, with people were either negatively or positively affecting my day. Well, like the process of going on Facebook and then like finding <laughs> or like stalking someone on Facebook and then like suddenly seeing like a post that you didn't expect to be there by yourself is sort of funny because it's, you know, challenging your like authorship and like agency in that situation. What made me angry is the most, the thing that stood out the most, I think. It's like, oh, maybe I shouldn't hang out with Mark. Maybe he's kind of a dick, huh? Um. <laughs> So we also made workbooks and, uh, to try and guide people through this process, and uh, we did a second trial performance at the Science Gallery in Dublin, this time with older people, um, and they had different reactions, um, which we explored. And we created these workbooks to kind of guide them through the experience. So I'll go quickly, but just wanted to show a few of the pages. 
So the idea is that uh, they would do this over a week and then each day of the week there was kind of like an additional activity they were supposed to do. And this was the key page. I mean, I think admit, um, <laughs> amidst rapid technological development and social discourse, it's so easy to dismiss something new with this knee-jerk reaction of like or dislike. Um, but the, the innovations and the changes that we're seeing aren't so black and white. So to really move forward, we have to engage with the tensions and the questions. It's not an option to just say, no, I don't want the future, because it's coming anyway. So the goal of People Keeper was to create a space for this. Um, yeah, so speaking of uh, kind of automating interactions, I'd always had this dream that I could make like this computer program that would, uh, I would just run it and would instantly make a bunch of um, IRL friends for me. And I, I also love the anticipatory feeling of accepting a new Facebook friend request, knowing that I'm about to spend like the night looking through all their posts and photos back to 2004. Um, and so while I haven't come up with this completely automatic friend script yet, this performance, Friend Crawl, um, was perhaps an attempt at one version of this. So working with electric objects, we created this Kickstarter and for $5 backers could commission new work from a few artists. And for each of the 1,000 backers, or more than 1,000 backers that backed this Kickstarter, I ran through my program manually. So I would spend five minutes with each person trying to get to know them better. I would search through all their social media feeds. If we were strangers or just acquaintances, I would kind of imagine that we were friends and try to imagine myself into the world. And, um, Spending five minutes with each person, I performed for 10 hours a day, nonstop for a week, and the performance was broadcast live on the internet uh, for anyone to follow along and watch. Um, Gita Board said, the spectacle is a social relation between people that is mediated by an accumulation of images that serve to alien us, alien, alienate us from a genuinely lived life. Um, I kind of butchered that quote, but anyway, my point is I found that there was something a little bit more genuine than perhaps he believed when I did this exercise. There was this understanding and this empathy that grew even as all the lives sort of blurred together for me on this platform. And basically I just became really obsessed with the idea of following people. And so I kind of began this next project. This is sort of a trailer video for it. up, I get dressed, I go out, I do things. I read a, a magazine and I find out about people. Why do I know about their lives? Somebody should be knowing about mine. I, I want to share things with people, but I, I don't want to have to talk to people and tell them what I'm doing. I think it'd be great for them to see what I'm doing. It takes time to build relationships. It takes time to touch base with people. So I don't want another relationship. I just want to have a relationship with somebody that I never have to talk to, that can just follow me and see me having a relationship with myself. If I, if I knew somebody was following me, watching my life, it might add some more fun to my life. I like to play. Doing something for having fun for myself would at the same time create a new experience for somebody else. I think I'm a pretty positive person and I think that the things I do are with consideration of other people. Who knows what somebody wants to see, but if I bring out the best self of myself, maybe, maybe that will spark something in them. So the idea is that follower is a service that provides real life follower for a day. And in order to be followed, you answer two questions. Um, why do you want to be followed and why should someone follow you? Um, some of the responses I got were things like, I believe my life has more of an online importance than it does in real life. I get more excitement and happiness from Instagram likes than I do from physical communication. I would really like to shift my presence from the online world to the real world and having someone follow me would give me some clarification that my life in the real world means more than online. Or I live a cloistered life in my apartment and office, and when I walk into the world, I feel completely covered in eyes, as if everyone was looking at me. 
I know they aren't, but I want to know at least one is. Um, so if you are selected, uh, you are sent a link to download this app, and when you open it, it just says waiting for a follower. And then one morning you wake up, and it says your follower is now following you. Um, and your follower, which was actually me, uh, would stay just out of sight, but kind of within your consciousness. So I would have a view kind of like this. So like the red thing is the person and the blue thing is me and I'm kind of like running down the block behind them, um, trying not to be seen, but they don't necessarily look, know what I look like. So that was a negotiation. Um, and then it, it would last the entire day and at the end of the day, you would get one photo of yourself from sometime during the day that I took with the notification you're no longer being followed. <laughs> Um, so we're living this weird, anxious, ti anxious time where on one hand, surveillance is pervasive and out of control, and on the other hand, we have this desire to be seen, to be followed, to share every intimate detail of our lives. There are sites you can go to buy online followers. If you feel you don't have enough, $10 can get you 1,000 followers. There's also sites you can go to figure out how real your followers are. But is that desire really fulfilled by watching your follower count tick upwards? And I was wondering, could a real-life follower provide something more meaningful or satisfying? How do we perform when we know or think someone is watching? And does that change when we're talking about physical space or one individual person versus a crowd of attention-divided people online? So also, follower offers surveillance as a luxury experience. This is an app for people who not only have nothing to hide, but need to be seen. Embedded in this offer is the question, who are the people that don't have the privilege of hiding, of not being seen? just because of who they are or what they look like. And then surveillance has been happening for a while, focused mainly on women. <laughs> now with the NSA, men are being watched too, and it becomes political. This implicit distinction is demonstrated in this headline um, where he says, just some woman following you around. Glossing over the implication here that the alternative, a man following a woman, would be completely terrifying and happens very often. Um, also, how many times have you seen the words just some man in any headline anywhere? Um, then with the gig economy, it seems we're willing to try any app that provides us something convenient, novel, or useful. But I think putting an interface between people is risky. It weakens your connection to the person on the other end. So I, I really like this hashtag, life after chores, as if the chores like disappeared, but they're still being done by a person. It's just the person that you don't see, right? Um, <laughs> Or uh, maybe if it's a person you don't have to see, then they could actually handle anything for you, like sit on the beach and hold our fire pit. Or I have a giant bug, please kill it. <laughs> these are real. Um, and these are, these are real quotes that are used as advertisements for TaskRabbit service. Um, and then with Uber or TaskRabbit, for example, you push a button and you watch as the person you summoned moves towards your location on a map. And so I wanted to invert this. So the person being followed didn't track my location, I tracked them. And when they get, what they get instead of a data point on a map is the thought that there is a person there watching them with care and focus. Um, it was also kind of a, a thing to, oops, actually get this into the, oh, get this into the app store. There's a, like a few guidelines you have to follow a few ways your app might get rejected. Um, if you look at the scroll, we're only halfway through right there, but I'll, I'll cut to the good ones. Um, so if you get through all those, there's also this rule. Um, this is a living document. New apps presenting new questions may result in new rules at any time. Perhaps your app will trigger this. <laughs> or we will reject apps for any content or behavior that we believe is over the line. What line, you ask? Well, as Supreme Court Justice once said, I'll know it when I see it. And we think that you will also know when you cross it. <laughs> um, so it's a little bit of an a uphill battle to get something like this into the App Store. But I was uh, persistent. And so I, it went from emails to phone calls to conversations with App Store representatives where they're saying, I don't understand how this is art, as you claim. It sounds more like a social experiment to me, because I was trying to say, like, it's no big deal. It's just like an art thing. Um, or then they had a problem because my descript, well, with the description that I put for the app, and they said, you need to explain to people why they care or want to do something. You can't expect them to just know or decide themselves. <laughs> <laughs> so they were telling me <laughs> I needed to like, explain to people in the description why they should get this app. Um, and so I found myself kind of trying to argue on my behalf, telling him about things like um, the following piece by Vito Akanchi, where he would pick a random stranger in public and follow them until they entered a private space. 
rest in peace, Vito, um, where Sophie Kyle's address book, where she found an address book on the uh, street and started going through it page by page and, and locating all the people that are listed and interviewing them and asking them about this person uh, whose address book she had found, trying to like, piece together a portrait of them uh, based on their, their stories of this person. Uh, this was uh, without the knowledge of the person who had lost the address book. Um, and it sort of reminds, connects for me to like Heather Dewey Hagborg's Stranger Visions, where she was uh, going around the streets of Brooklyn and New York, picking up pieces of trash, like a cigarette butt or a piece of chewed gum, extracting the DNA, and then reconstructing a portrait of what that person might have looked like. Um, or Jill Madgett's Evidence Locker, where she was walking around Liverpool for a month in this red jacket with uh, CCTV cameras trained on her and sort of collaborating with the police. She would have them aim the cameras at her or guide her as she had her eyes closed moving through the city um, and then later collected all this footage by filling out subject access request forms, which she sort of filled out like a love letter. So it was this investigation of a system uh, as a sort of relationship partner. Um, and ultimately, I want to create different sorts of interactions and relationships that we, than we have normally. I'm wondering, as much as technology might separate us at times, could it also bring us together in new and interesting ways? Um, and so I just wanted to share a few photos from some of the people I followed. Their titles are taken from their answers to those questions about why they want to be followed. Um, and the thing I find is people always ask for like, big stories, like, what was it like to follow? Tell me the most amazing moment. Um, but it was really the little mo moments that moved me. That first moment of catching sight of my followee was always really exhilarating and surreal. I tried to maintain the right distance from the person so that they might begin to notice me by the end of the day, if they paid close attention, so they could have a similar strange and surreal experience. I didn't want it to be a complete thought experiment, so if the person uh, felt they had the chance of seeing me, I hoped it might further heighten their awareness. I love the moments where I could be sitting one table over from someone in a cafe, wondering if they were wondering if I was their follower. Some people I would follow on long walks and adventures. While others would go straight to their office and never leave while I sat outside the building thinking about them, <laughs> watching them move from room to room on the map on my phone. When I was doing friend crawl, I was overwhelmed by how much people sort of blended together and started to feel the same. But in contrast, while I was physically following someone, so much of my attention was on them, and every little gesture felt interesting and meaningful. I wasn't Googling every fact ever posted about them online. I was instead watching them interact with a cashier, look for a place to sit on the BART, or choose something to eat, and trying to extrapolate a whole person just from that. Um, so I want to talk now about uh, someone else I followed. I started following this person after discover discovering him online about five years ago. Um, I followed him for a year across various social media apps and email lists until finally, a year later, I received notification that he knew of my existence. And not only that, he'd begun following me back. So I immediately forwarded this to one of my best friends, letting him know I had unlocked an achievement. And thus began our relationship. Um, it was a little hard at first, because one of the things that I really liked about being single was this feeling that I was anonymous. Especially in New York, I felt like I could kind of drop off the map at any point and nobody would know where I was or what I was doing, um, or holding on to me as a picture of like a person that should exist. But then suddenly there was this person that was following me around. He was checking in with me, asking how I was doing, where I was going, what I was thinking, who I was. I didn't know how to reconcile this need to be alone with the desire to also be close to him. So we devised a performance to understand this better. Um, around that time, Nest Drop Cam had just come out. I just wanted to share this little video.
<laughs> so we were sold. We bought a few, um, because why not? And we were thinking about this idea of like the magic of home or hashtag caught on drop cam and wondering like what does that what does that really mean? Um, and when you're talking about a home surve surveillance system, are there any boundaries? Like where where does privacy play into that? And do you want all this this data and footage sent to Google? So for one week we cut off all communication with each other. Our only connection was a drop cam placed in each of our apartments with a live feed accessible to the other. Anytime we watched the feed, video of our own face was also captured, implicating us in the watching. We called this project Lovin. Spy agencies often refer to the various types of intelligence collection with the suffix of int, such as sigint for collecting signals intelligence or communications, or humint for human intelligence or spying. Around that time, there, were, there was news of scandalous love int going on, that is, NSA employees surveilling their loved ones. Uh, most of us generally have the, a negative reaction to this idea or to surveillance, and rightly so, but sometimes it's more complicated than that. What do you do when you're dealing with an omniscient gaze of love? I'm interested in these alternative relationships to surveillance and tracking, ones that aren't black and white, they don't start with Snowden or the Panopticon, but ones that acknowledge that looking, following, and keeping track of each other is an integral part of relationships and requires careful consideration and negotiation. Um, so once we had done this performance, our, our relationship was off to a good start, but we realized there were some tweaks that needed to be made still. So we, we came with this idea called um, man or woman in the middle. Um, which is a reference to a security attack where uh, data passing from one point to another can be kind of like intercepted in the middle and modifi modified. So what we did is we made a system for ourselves where when we would uh, text message each other, there was a layer of code that would run and it would allow us to modify the message either coming or going uh, programmatically. And so each of us had one section of the software that we could modify that dealt with uh, our own messages. Um, so you can see uh, Kyle's here, uh, was a little bit more complex than mine, but there were things like, it would look for the phrase, we should, and it would just automatically reply, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, or if I wrote hi, it would respond, how's it going? I've been thinking about you. <laughs> um, and then on my end, I, would just try, I was trying to be more positive, so I, it would replace anything I sent that said, I don't know, to okay. It would replace whatever with sure. Uh, or uh, whatever with yes, maybe with definitely, um, ug with blank space, or a frowny face it would remove completely. Um, and yeah, so th that, that helped. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but there's this other problem, once we solved this one, which is that, um, so I was around 28 and suddenly I found this this thing that happened, which is I would just be walking down the street, like eating a bagel, and then suddenly I was like, I need a baby. Um, or I was like, you know, sitting at my laptop working, and then I was like, where's my baby? Um, and I was talking to some other uh, female friends of mine, and not all of them, but some others around my age had this similar kind of experience. And the other thing we noticed was that, like, our, our male partners were not having that experience very much um, and having trouble understanding ours. Uh, and so I devised this browser extension um, and I thought, you know, if Google and Facebook can, can control what you see and think, why can't I? Um, so working with Charlotte Stiles, uh, we tried to replicate that feeling of just babies on the mind by, um, I would, this is an extension you could install on your partner's computer and without them knowing, it would sort of swap out text filter, add images, et cetera, um, it, in an attempt to kind of like get babies onto their minds too, or to make them think about it. Um, it seemed to me like a little less devious than like putting a pin through a condom. Um, <laughs> or was it? In any case, it was much less effective because I didn't get the baby, which maybe it's okay for now. Um, anyway, so you can, you can get this from the extension, Google Chrome extension store if you like. Um, <laughs> So it didn't, it didn't get me a baby, but I did learn that maybe there's some things that you can't hack. Some things that require talking, compromise, time. Um, and so even if each of these little experiments that I showed you were effectively failures, they serve some purpose. 
as Kyle and I were talking about software architecture and stor server storage and cron jobs, we also had to talk about the underlying lessons or reasons that we did these projects in the first place. So as we encounter racist bots, glitchy intelligence, broken tools, I hope that we can also embrace the potential for conversation around these issues and work together towards a less buggy future. I wanted to switch gears a bit for this last part and talk about a different way that I've been following. So I think it started in 2012 that I was um, at a conference and I heard Zach Lieberman, who's the creator of a software tool called Open Frameworks, speak on a panel about open source tools. And at one point he said, if you're a woman, there's a spot at the table here for you too. Before that moment, I hadn't ever thought about contributing to open source. Uh, I hadn't realized I wanted to be a part of it, mostly because I didn't even consider that I could. His words began this journey for me that I'm still on today, and I think back to it often because it made me realize how significant and necessary a clear, explicit invitation could be. So I was excited, and I began trying to get involved with some of these communities. I joined some mailing lists. I started following some repositories on GitHub, and the thing I realized was that you really had to kind of like elbow your way in to be a part of the conversation around these tools. And for someone like me, maybe it's you know being a woman in a mostly male space, or maybe it's just me being shy, I didn't feel like I felt very comfortable elbowing my way in, and I imagined other people didn't either. Around the same time, I ran into Casey Reese, who uh, creates another tool called Processing, and mentioned this to him. And I said, I wish there was something I could do to change this um, but I don't feel like I'm going to go be like some sort of women in code activist or start a meetup or some whole plan like that. And, I, and talking to him, he made me realize like maybe you don't need a whole plan. You could just try and get involved in whatever way you can. Just do something. And maybe others would see that example and, and they might follow. Um, so then a week later, that, that opportunity came when he said, so speaking of, do you want to work on processing? Um, and so after our conversation, I felt like I couldn't really say no. Um, so I was in. And my charge was to imagine processing, which is a creative coding tool uh, that works really well on the desktop, um, to say, what would it look like if you created it today for the web? Um, so this was it. I had my big chance. I had my in. I was going to participate in open source. I was super excited. I started immediately and got to doing like nothing, nothing for a really long time. Um, Basically, I was just, I was scared. I didn't, I barely understood the question. I doubted I knew anything uh, in terms of like how to do it. And so I just kind of sat on it until finally I, I think Casey checked in with me again and was like, hey, um, how's it going? And, and the thing he said was, you know, you don't have to have the whole plan. Once again, like just try and do something. I'm like do something by next week if you could. Um, <laughs> so deadlines, deadlines are helpful too. Um, so I did. Um, and these were some of the first experiments, just getting some text on the screen, just making some images appear. Um, I didn't have a good sense of where I was going, but I just kept doing small things. And then at some point, it got to a point of almost parity with uh, processing. So you can make graphics in 2D, 3D. You can work with mobile, webcam, Arduino, et cetera. Um, but it's really important to me that this question of what would processing look like today um, the obvious answer is, oh, make it with HTML5, make it with JavaScript. Um, but for me, another piece of that that was really important was, uh, what happens if we hold diversity as a core value? That people don't feel like they have to elbow their way in, but they just feel invited. And how do we make this explicit rather than implicit? So the, it was not to take anything away from, you know, uh, coder communities of, of previous, but to try and build on them. And to say, you know, you don't need to be an excerpt expert to participate. You don't have to elbow your way in. Um, being interested and willing to learn should be enough. So let's take, what if we take uncertainty as a starting point, an acknowledgement that we don't yet understand everything and that we want to learn together. And this idea that like no tool is neutral. Tools are embedded with the beliefs and the desires and the biases of their creators. And so if we're talking about a tool for creative expression, it becomes even more critical that we have a lot of different voices in the process of building that tool. It can't just be a few developers making all the decisions. Um, so we, we did a lot of exercises trying to expand the possible uses. We asked what else might we want to express? What else might we want to encode? And whose views are represented here? And can we throw out some of our ideas about how software is supposed to work and see what happens when, when we give ourselves some freedom to experiment? 
Um, and so later that year, we held the first um, P5JS Contributors Conference. And this was a time when about 35 people kind of descended on CMU, and our goal was to work for a week on P5JS. And all along, I'd been saying, like, you don't have to be an expert in programming. Like, anyone should be able to participate. Everyone is welcome. Everyone will be able to do something here. And then I was kind of like, oh, God. Like, is that really true? I'm not sure. <laughs> All these people are coming. I don't know how it's gonna work. Um, yeah, so I was, I was terrified. Um, but there, and I thought, like, how am I gonna help all these people? Like, I, there's just one of me. Um, and what I realized is it just, it really worked itself out. You know, I, I kind of introduced things to start, and then people started, like, as soon as they understood something, they would teach it to someone else. We had some rules, like, you have to be willing to be interrupted with a question at any point. Um, and that's not always, the most practical thing, but uh, for this week, that's the rule. You can't wear like large headphones, you have to be available. And we just started um, kind of mapping it out and letting different people take leadership over different parts. And I was really excited, people were teaching each other, over half of the participants were women, over, but even more exciting, like over half made their first contribution to an open source project. And here, this is um, Cece teaching Shar, who had just, uh, Cece had just learned how to like submit a pull request and she's like teaching uh, someone else how to do it uh, immediately afterwards. Um, or Stephanie Pai, who gave this great lecture on like how, yeah, you know, mentorship and, and hard work is important, but access is like what we need at the base. Without that, we've got nothing. Um, or Emily Chen doing research into the Python community and trying to bring back lessons and saying, you know, we can't all assu assume that everyone knows how to do everything. We have to be, you know, okay with people not knowing and, and make that feel all right. Um, or Maya Mann was going through the GitHub issues of our project and trying to event identify places where the language worked really well or places where we should um, do better. And out of that came this community statement, which has been really important to us. Um, and the idea is to be explicit to be really clear about who's invited and you know, how serious we are about that. And then practically, what does that mean? Um, I was really excited to see this one time. This is, um, so normally at a GitHub issue, it's often kind of a little hostile and a lot of times like beginner issues get uh, closed with like, you know, read the manual, you, you didn't get it. And in this case, um, uh, I'll just put it again. So someone logs an issue and it's sort of like he didn't quite understand how to use the library. And then someone answers it. But then someone goes further and says like, oh, the fact that you didn't understand in the first place, that's like our bad. How do we fix that? And everyone starts sort of brainstorming until it gets to the last comment where the original poster is like, wow, I feel like I like, added something to this project. And I thought I would just feel like an idiot. Um, and so that feels like a big, big win for me. And th these are the important moments, I think. Um, so along with Ben Fry, Casey Reese, the original creators of Processing, Daniel Schiffman, um, we created, or they created the Processing Foundation and I joined them in 2014. Um, and now we also have Johanna Hedva, Razi Spell, and Jesse Khan Thompson working with us. The idea is to like, give us a structure to expand on these ideas even more. Um, and so one thing we've begun recently is this fellowship program. This, this is actually outdated, these are our fellows from last year but um, we just got a second round. And the idea is that a fellow is someone that um, has some sort of project of their own that's related to expanding P5JS or processing um, and in a specific community or in a specific way, and we sort of support them in doing that. Um, and just to give you some examples, um, and this is Luisa Pereira, who was uh, looking at ways to help with the education side of P5JS, and so she made this video um, that was just basically like spelling out what all the different files in the code repository are and like how they fit together, which is not something that like a beginner would understand at all, but she did it in this way that's um, very friendly. And I, I sped this video up, but it, it goes at a much more reasonable pace. Um, or the Digital Citizens Lab, which is Sharon De La Cruz, Leslie Martinez, and Evan Wu, which um, their project was to create a creative coding platform using P5.js where children can rewrite or revisualize a narrative by changing the logic of events. Um, and the, the idea was to try and make something that was directed specifically towards children of immigrants and people of color. So using characters that would be sort of familiar and uh, relatable for them. Um, this is a project by Chelly Jin, um, who's doing an interview series and like curating the homepage sketch um, with a series of Asian women and gender non-conforming artists. So this is the website she built to highlight that. 
Um, just to give you a sense of the project, these are some of the people she interviewed and some of the sketches that have been made. And if you want to check this out, you can um, actually see it at diversity.p5js.org. Um, this is a project by Chen Chen Ye, uh, which is up there right now. Um, and for each artist that creates a sketch, there's also an interview that uh, Chelly does, and she posts the documentation. Um, or Claire Cuny Volpe was working on accessibility to P5.js, uh, for P5.js, and focusing on the blind and seeing impaired. You know, this question of what do you do if the Hello World program is a circle or a blinking LED? Shouldn't you be able to be a creative coder if you can't see? Um, so she would hold these workshops where people would try to understand what that experience of coding without vision is like. Um, or in the left side here, she's introducing this high contrast mode that we're adding to our web editor, which is forthcoming. Um, or on the left, you can also see, or on the right, you can actually also see um, some of the accessibility things we're adding in terms of offering different types of audio feedback while you're coding, so it doesn't have to be primarily visual. Um, or Taeyun Choi's Signing Coders project, where he uh, held coding workshops and he taught them with a sign language uh, interpreter. And with each of these projects, I, I always felt this worry, like, what if we do it wrong? We don't have this whole plan. What if, what if we insult someone? What if we just are totally off base? And what I really realized from all these projects is, like, you don't necessarily have to have the whole plan. You can follow the lead of others. You just have to listen. Um, and so, for example, you know, Tane started doing these workshops, and he realized sort of immediately that, like, it needed to be a lot more physical. And so at the second workshop, he just reworked the tools he was using to, to be much more um, understandable by the people in the workshop. And so for all of these, this is a quote um, that Chandler McWilliams introduced uh, during a panel we had at the Contributors Conference, and he said, uh, the quote is, I and mine do not convince by arguments, similes, rhymes. We convince by our presence. That's from Walt Whitman. So for me, it's about paying attention and listening to someone, being curious about what they're doing, how they're doing, and how you can work with them better. I think these things go such a long way. You know, it's about showing up. It's about being present. Um, I just left. Uh, thanks, 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 thanks. Thanks, ITP thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. But this, this super cut always stands out to me. Thanks, thanks. Thank you. This is the thank thesis you. presentation. Thank you. Um, thank you, thank you. 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 So we have this idea of the brilliant singular artist, but what I see at ITP, and it seems to be the same in a lot of these communities that we're a part of, is the acknowledgement that we follow each other, that we build on each other's tools, ideas, words, mistakes, projects. We borrow, remix, remake, and reinterpret. We don't always have a big plan. But we're not afraid to just try something to follow and to be followed. That's all. Thank you.